the Godhead, meaning divine nature. The Godhead discussion has been one of the major divided points throughout Christian history. The two major views that exist are the doctrine of the Trinity and modalism. Modalism is a doctrine that states that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit represent three modes or aspects of divine revelation, not distinct and coexistent persons in the divine nature. Other variations of this are adoptionism, where Yeshua was adopted at either his baptism, resurrection, or ascension, and Arianism, where Yeshua did not always exist, therefore not co-eternal with the Father. The Trinity states that there is one God existing in three co-equal, co-eternal, co-substantial, defined persons. So the Trinity is one God represented through three persons, while modalism is one God in one person represented in three different forms. Now proponents against the Trinity state that if you have three persons, then you have three distinct conscious beings, therefore three gods, which is called triteism. Proponents against modalism state that the modalist doctrine does not reflect the New Testament revelations and the beliefs of the early church fathers. So how can we determine who is right? The best way to approach this issue is to gain an understanding of ancient Israel's view of God. Since Christianity came from the belief system of Mosaic Israel. One of the most famous lines from the Old Testament, the daily prayer of ancient Israel, the equivalent of the Lord's Prayer, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Historically speaking, without a question, Israel made this the center point of their monotheism, that while other nations serve multiple gods, Israel only served one God, the Most High. So from this, one can logically assume that the doctrine of the Trinity is contradictory to the ancient Israel's view of God. Therefore Yeshua cannot be the Messiah, much less the Son of God. But does the Shema really prohibit a triune God? Let's look closer at the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. The Lord, L-O-R-D, in all caps, is the English translation of the historical name from the God of Israel, represented by the letters Y-H-W-H. While there are other views on the correct pronunciation, the majority of scholarship agrees that this is pronounced Yahweh. While one can get caught up with the proper pronunciation debate, it is important to understand the meaning behind this word, the eternal self-existent. You see, naturalism assigns these attributes to the universe, despite being proven wrong. So this is a logical view of God contrasting against the other cultures who assign unobserved phenomena to the actions of multiple divine beings. So let's place the Lord with the proper name Yahweh. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. What about the Hebrew word for God? Interestingly, the word for God, Elohim, is a plural noun. Like the English word for deity, 
God. The plural for this word is gods. The plural for Elohim is not Elohims. The word is already plural. There exists a singular Hebrew word for God, Eloha. So why wasn't this word used? Does the plural word for God allow God to be triune? Historically, the Jews would say no. The use of the word Elohim has always been understood to mean singular when referring to Yahweh. But the word was not exclusively used for Yahweh. It was used to refer to the gods of the other nations, such as the Elohim of Egypt, and also used to refer to the children of Israel. So the biblical use of this word has always referred to plurality. So why use this word when referring to the one God? One argument is that the word was used in referring to a singular person, Moses, in Exodus 7.1, where Yahweh said to Moses, See, I make you Elohim to Pharaoh. But right after this, it says, And Aaron your brother is your prophet. So it can be argued that the Elohim referred to both Moses and Aaron. But one of the best arguments I have heard for the use of the plural word Elohim was the contrast of the God of Israel to the other nations. As stated earlier, the other nations during the time of the Exodus assigned multiple gods to the sun, moon, stars, oceans, while Israel assigned one God, Yahweh, as the cause of all natural phenomena. So the word Elohim encompasses that the one God is the God of all creation. But still, this does not mean that they could not use a singular noun to describe Yahweh. So let's look at the Shema one more time with the proper Hebrew words. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Without argument, the New Testament definitely points to a triune God. As even stated by Yeshua himself, baptizing them to the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But here is where it gets even deeper. Not that Yeshua only referenced a triune God, but gave the revelation of God as revealed through the Shema. Listen closely and pay attention. It was winter and the festival of the dedication of the temple was being celebrated in Jerusalem. Jesus was walking in Solomon's porch in the temple when the people gathered round him. How long are you going to keep us in suspense? Tell us the plain truth. Are you the Messiah? I have already told you, but you would not believe me. The deeds I do by my father's authority speak on my behalf. But you will not believe, for you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never die. No one can snatch them away from me. What my Father has given me is greater than everything, and no one can snatch them away from the Father's care. The Father and I are one. The Father and I are one. The Father and I are one. But wait, I thought only Yahweh was one. The Jews definitely knew what he was referencing, that he was elevating himself to the oneness of Yahweh and that he and the Father make up this oneness of the proper name given to the God of Israel. 
The Jews only recognize the Father as Yahweh is one. But now you have Yeshua stating He and the Father are one. Because of this clear understanding of what Yeshua was claiming, elevating himself to the revelation of the Shema, look at their reaction. And the people again picked up stones to throw at him. I have done many good deeds in your presence, which the Father gave me to do. For which one of these do you want to stone me? We do not want to stone you because of any good deeds, but because of your blasphemy. You're only a man, but you're trying to make yourself God. <laughs> they wanted to kill him. And the accusation was blasphemy. And what was the claim of blasphemy? You being a man, making yourself God. Now look at Yeshua's response. It is written in your own law that God said you are gods. We know that what the scripture says is true forever. And God called those people gods. The people to whom his message was given. As for me, the Father chose me and sent me into the world. How then can you say that I blaspheme? Because I said that I am the Son of God. He gave them a correct understanding of the word Elohim as he quoted Psalm 82 6, which was mentioned earlier. So if the word Elohim was used to refer to the children of Israel, he said, Why do you say I am blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. And he does not back down from this revelation by saying, Do not believe me then, if I am not doing the things my Father wants me to do, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, you should at least believe my deeds, in order that you may know, once and for all, that the Father is in me, and that I am in the Father. Blasphemy! In me is the Father, and I in Him, so that He doesn't exist without the Father, and the Father doesn't exist without Him. They try to kill Him again. By claiming that the Father is in Him, and He is in the Father, which makes Him co-equal, co-eternal, co-substantial, taking on the expression in the term Yahweh, the eternal self-existent. This was one of the major accusations that caused Yeshua to be crucified. The Gospel of John undoubtedly gives us a clear reference to the divine nature of Yeshua. But there is another verse that undoubtedly gives us the clear nature of the triune God as revealed by the New Testament. But this verse comes with much controversy as it is called the Johannian Coma. It is penned by the same author of the Gospel of John, the Apostle John, in his letter, 1 John 5 7. And it goes There are three who bear witness in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Despite this being referenced by Cyprian in the third century, again, it is written of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And it being found in early Latin manuscripts, a prologue that discusses the removal of the verse, where much error has occurred at the hands of unfaithful translators, contrary to the truth of faith, who have kept just the three words, water, blood, and spirit, in this edition, a meeting mention of Father, Word, and Spirit. In a century sermon that quotes it being part of the original epistle. As John says, there are three things that bear witness. They say on earth, water, flesh, and blood, and these three are one. 
and there are three things they testify in heaven, Father, Word, and Spirit, and these three are one, in Christ Jesus. The majority consensus is that this verse was not part of the original letter by John because it is not found in the early Greek manuscripts. Also, a majority of denominations do not consider the Latin manuscripts as authoritative since it is used by the Catholic Church, therefore creating a bias against the Latin manuscripts. Despite Paul reaching Rome with Christianity, as documented in the letter to the Romans. Greek was a universal tongue, but Latin was the Roman language. The context of this verse makes sense in John's letter. The heavenly testimony is from God, Father, Word, Holy Spirit, and the earthly testimony is from man, spirit, water, and blood. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. If we remove verse 7, we remove the witness of God. But here is the undisputable point. Whether you believe this verse was or was not part of the original epistle, without a doubt, there existed people as early as the 3rd century, before the Council of Nicaea, who believed this verse was part of the original epistle. This verse is without a doubt a direct reference to the Triune God. Now let's place the New Testament revelation to the Old Testament revelation of God. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our Elohim, Yahweh is one, and the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are all revealed to be God in the New Testament. So let's substitute the terminology in the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit is our Elohim. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are one. Grammatically, this does not violate the language. The plurality of the noun Elohim allows for the multiple subjects and the unity of the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit allow for the unity of the proper name, Yahweh, to be one. And with the New Testament revelation, the Trinity is clearly seen in the Old Testament. So a proper diagram of the Trinity would be as follows. And here it is with the Hebrew words of Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. Since the Word became flesh, it can also be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who we have the Ab, the Ben, and the Ruach HaKodesh, as the eternal Godhead represented by the proper name, Yahweh. It was as if the Shema was supposed to be the schoolmaster for Israel for when the Messiah was revealed they would embrace the unity of the Godhead. And there were many first century Jews, such as the Apostle John, who embraced this revelation. Now this concept may seem confusing to many, as many have tried to find earthly comparisons to make sense of a triune God, without being accused of worshiping three distinct gods. The unity were three separate gods, then that would not be a unity. The Elohim, of other nations were not united, and they often opposed one another. Also, each god was a product of another god, as with the Trimurti, not with the Trinity. There is no other god that compares to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who has always existed, 
neither of them having a beginning or end, but yet they are distinguishable. One comparison of the Trinity is, I am one Richie, but I am a husband, a father, and an engineer. But this is modalism, as Richie is one person taking on three distinct roles. Another comparison is water, where it exists as liquid, vapor, and ice. But this is also modalism, and there is one H2O compound that takes on three different forms. Plus, on top of that, there is also a fourth phase of water, plasma. But this is a bad comparison. Other attempts of explanation were to use philosophical principles of higher dimensions, that we exist in a lower dimension, therefore we are unable to understand how one God can be three persons. This is Gnosticism, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And when he was asked by Philip, show us the Father, Yeshua replied, have I been with you for such a long time with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how do you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? Therefore, the Godhead is not a mystery. The great mystery is godliness where God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the nations, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So if the Godhead is no longer a mystery, what earthly comparison can we compare it to in order to have a full understanding? In the first chapter of Genesis, it is written, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So the best earthly comparison to compare the Godhead to is what he created in his image. The family.